Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, adapters. Welcome back to another exciting episode. Joining me is Bill Weir, the chief climate correspondent at CNN. Bill takes us through his remarkable transition to full-time climate reporting. We discuss the evolving landscape of climate journalism, and Bill shares his insights into how climate change now intersects with every aspect of our lives, transforming all beats into climate beats. We also talk about what inspired him to write his new book, Life As We Know It, a book focusing on positive climate stories inspired by the birth of his son. We also critique how the media is covering the emerging climate adaptation sector, and Bill gives us a sneak preview of some exciting adaptation cover that CNN is planning. I won't steal his thunder, but you'll have to listen. Bill has traveled the world as a journalist and interviewed some of the most interesting people on the planet. Bill shares an awkward moment he had with Paul McCartney. Yes, that Paul McCartney. And as my listeners know, I love talking to journalists, and this was a fantastic and inspiring conversation. Bill will leave you with some practical advice on how you can bring climate communication into the important adaptation work you're doing. I hope you enjoy. Okay, but before we get started, let's talk about the Big Apple. Yes, I mean New York City. I'm headed there to participate and record at the 2024 Waterfront Conference hosted by the Waterfront Alliance, a U.S.-based nonprofit organization with over 1,100 partners. This conference is all about real change for our waterfronts and coastlines. Now in its 17th year, the Waterfront Conference has become the go-to forum for discussing and strategizing on the challenges faced by our entire nation. If you go, and I hope you do, you'll be joining over 600 participants, including policymakers, community leaders, scientists, engineers, architects, academics, and environmental advocates, and professionals from labor, real estate, insurance, and the finance sectors. And yes, podcasters will be there. The event explores everything from climate change solutions to sustaining robust coastal economies, ensuring equitable access to our waterfronts and waterways, and fostering a healthier open space environment. I'm very excited to be participating in the Waterfront Conference. I'll be there moderating sessions, participating in breakouts, and hopefully meeting all of you who participate. It's happening May 21st, 2024, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City. And they are offering something special for my listeners, a 10% discount on your ticket. Tickets, just use the code AMERICA at checkout. Plus, there are special rates for students and nonprofits. So whether you're a policy junkie like me, an environmental advocate, or just someone who cares about the future of our planet, this conference is for you. For more information on the Waterfront Conference and the incredible work of the Waterfront Alliance, head over to waterfrontalliance.org. There are links in my show notes. Guys, it's New York City. My mouth is already watering on the food I'll eat. Reach out if you have some great New York pizza suggestions. Okay, hopefully I'll see you there. All right, now let's join Bill Weir and talk climate change in the media. Hey, Adapters, I've got an exciting episode for you. Joining me is Bill Weir. Bill is the chief climate correspondent at CNN. Hi, Bill. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Doug. So cool to be with you. I love talking to journalists. I've had quite a few on. But first off, I know this might seem obvious, but what does a chief climate correspondent really cover? That's a great question. For most of my career, I resisted a beat because I didn't want to be pigeonholed. And I was a generalist, an anchor. I spent a decade at ABC before a decade over here at CNN. And I like politics and I like entertainment. I didn't want to eat the same thing every day. I'm an omnivore. But when they created a climate desk at CNN, it occurred to me that this is the beat that includes all the other beats. We like to think of it as a menu item that pollsters throw out, like what's important to you every election cycle. I argue it's the whole restaurant, everything from foreign policy to the economy, science, technology, food, transportation, shelter is all systems built for a planet that honestly doesn't exist anymore. And and all of these things are being roiled by a, a planet that's overheating at a scary rate. So I like to say that we're all climate correspondents, whether we know it or not, much the way everybody in every newsroom became a health reporter during the pandemic. So when did you make this transition to full-time climate change report? Is it when you went over to CNN? Because you've got an extensive history. You're on Good Morning America, ABC News. So when did you make like this full transition? And was it at CNN? Was it CNN? I'm proud to say that this is the first real network to create such a position after other newspapers had sort of led the way with more urgent climate coverage. And it came after I'd been here a while and I originally came to CNN to be just a primetime anchor, and I had some ideas on how to sort of reinvent cable news in primetime, a lot more field pieces and a lot more remotes. But 
I actually started right around the time the Malaysian airliner went missing. And I fe- spent my first month on the air talking about the same story every night. I thought I'd made wow. a horrible mistake, but my bosses said, well, maybe you should do an original series, like get out into the world. And they had just hired Anthony Bourdain and wanted more shows like his. And I said, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. I want to go to the wonders of the world and wonder what will be left of them when my daughter turns my age in the year 2050. And they said, yes. And it was the greatest green light ever. So we shot three or four seasons, actually, of that show in almost 30 countries. And some of the stories were focused on societal changes, but a lot of times it came back to climate and the environment. And so I just think my love of the outdoors and nature made me that guy, (laughs) you know, at the network. So when a climate beat came up, that was kind of the obvious choice. And because I like to look at the world in that way to see how interconnected things happen and and how the intersection between nature and human nature, that's when I became that guy. I've had this conversation with Mike, Michael Korn at the Washington Post and, uh, you know, Christopher Flavel. He was at Bloomberg and now he's at New York Times. And how do you decide what climate stories to tell? Because that in itself was, is there like you guys talking around? I mean, you can cover like a, a hurricane event, but is there a real strategy in t- trying to figure out what you want to convey to the public around this issue? There's just such a, a vast grab bag of possibilities. Uh, our team has now grown to about a dozen people, writers, digital writers, editors, severe weather specialists, and visual data visualization folks. And we're constantly figuring out what's going on. We have people based in the UK and London. We have some in Abu Dhabi. And so we have international stories that are thrown around all the time. And I personally, I have the luxury of getting to pitch and direct some of the stuff I get to do. Some of it is just the bosses will see a story that they think is interesting. For example, a piece went viral on social media about Salisbury Beach, Massachusetts, this beach town on a barrier island up on the New Hampshire border where they had watched their high tide line get higher and higher and beach erosion get worse and worse. And they band together every decade or so. The neighbors, because in Massachusetts, won't replenish sand on private property. They go in on big, massive shipment of sand. They This year, they spent $600,000 on 15,000 tons of sand, and they thought it would last them five years, and it washed away in a single storm. Hmm. And that story, then I go up there, I have the luxury of just finding it as it comes and meeting as many folks as I can. And it became a really interesting story just on climate psychology, how the guy who organized the sand purchase doesn't believe in climate change, even though he's is as stark as it gets. And meanwhile, his neighbors are just now coming around to the concept that the place where they built so many memories probably at this rate won't be there anymore. And when you talk to each man, depending on your perspective of of whether this is climate change or not, their ideas for how to fix it are very different. The first guy thinks the state should step in. And if it takes a million dollars worth of sand a year to keep their billion dollars worth of property, so be it. The neighbor knows that's not sustainable and knows that there are dozens of other beach communities just in that state that need similar fortification. And there's no way to make that choice. And sometimes it's I'm looking honestly for solutions because I need a break from the peer-reviewed doom. It's just a fire hose of horrible news. And if I focus on extinction for too long or politics for too long, it can get very dark. But I... Love looking for dreamers and doers and solution seekers. And there's just been this wave of new investment and energy since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. And to to talk to innovators about thermal batteries, the idea that just a hot rock in a box could make the steam that serves 3 million people in New York City as Con Edison tries to green their infrastructure or to meet a woman like Annette Rubin, this NFL wife who was taken to the Gulf Coast when her husband retired from playing and 12 weeks after having her first baby got hit by a Category 5 Hurricane Michael. And it shook her so much. She looked at her neighbors like, you guys do this every year? (laughs) You don't know if your house is going to fall on your kids or not? I'm not doing that. And she went looking for a hurricane-proof house, no experience in construction, ended up importing a technology from Italy that she's now built a business around because she doesn't want other moms to go through this. To people I met in Paradise, California, five years after that wildfire, and what they've learned, the lessons, the people who stayed, who came and moved in, how they build fireproof construction now, 
I have the luxury of covering the big stories that pop nationally, both as they're happening, but then to go back and see what lessons learned, to go back to Puerto Rico a year after Maria and see what's really happening. I'll be going back to Maui after their fires to see the fight over indigenous water rights. There's so many layers to that story. And really, it's just sort of dealer's choice on any given day. Some stories just capture the imagination and the tension, like the wildfire smoke that goes coast to coast, to somebody's got a new idea for a wind turbine that's vertical instead of spins and runs around on a track and is a gee whizzy story. And over time, I've come to learn the stories that work the best are getting the viewer invested. This is my sort of not recipe, but on the wonder list, you just remind people why these places are so valuable, make them fall in love with it, but then pull the rug out from under. Here are the threats. Here's how fast it's going away. But then take the story arc to hope if you can. And well, But here's the people who are committed to saving this. Here's their idea. They just need this to happen. I love it all. I love the problem stories. I love the solution stories of the human element of it. I don't think we talk about the topic nearly enough because it's been so politicized and demagogue for so long. But there are so many fascinating ways to think about <laughs> our little blue marble and how connected we are. And now's the time to have those conversations before things get worse. Your book is out now and your book is Life as We Know It. And congratulations on this book. And let's get the background there. What inspired you to write it? And maybe I'm putting you on the spot there and you're going to explain, but there's some letters involved. I don't know if you have access maybe to a short letter that you could read, but tell us a bit about that inspiration for the book. Yeah, it actually started when I became a new old dad in my 50s. I have a daughter who's now 20 years old, but when she was 16, and I'd been through a divorce and had been covering climate full time for a couple of years and really, really immersed in the scary stuff. I was kind of in a dark headspace, but then much to our amazement, my partner and I, who didn't think she could conceive, we had a baby boy and was so delighted. It connected me with my daughter in a whole new way. And But at the time, at the height of the pandemic, I was looking out, at, holding this little bundle and looking out at a world in lockdown Thinking about the climate stories, I just covered California fires and my partner wore a mask that smelled like smoke to the hospital for River's birth and I wasn't able to be there for the delivery. So I started writing these Earth Day letters thinking, well, maybe he'll read these in 20 years when he has big questions (laughs) and wonder what we were doing at the time. And at first they were really sort of letters of apology. I'm sorry we broke your planet, broke your sea and your sky and, and shortened the wings of the nightingale. But I'm so glad you're here because the world needs helpers. Mr. Rogers taught me, he ceased to say that when he saw something scary on TV, his mother taught him to look for the helpers. And I meet so many helpers, both in rushing into disaster these days, but just people leaving lives of quiet service and looking for solutions all the time. And so I set out to kind of write a practical, handy guide on how to live in this world we built for for accident for him, like where to live, where would be the haven to start a family, what kind of house to build, what is the smartest way to feed yourself that makes the most sense for the planet, what does community look like as these stressors happen, how do we talk to each other? And it really got me, as I widened the the aperture, rethinking the pyramid of needs, like the basic stuff that keeps us alive, the love and esteem needs we're trying to fill through social media. And connecting all those themes in just letters to both my kids. The first part is to river, as you think about the basics, air, water, temperature, shelter, food. And then the latter chapter is about love and esteem uh, to my daughter, Olivia, who's now 20. And so it's kind of all over the place. (laughs) It's history and psychology and, and, and biography and reportage in there. But it's sort of just maybe aiming it at my kids gave me liberty. I'm I'm not the kind of person who can write a self help book and tell people how to live. There's tips in here on how to pre-cool your home and and build more efficient construction and all of that. But for me, the big takeaway was the the more we connect with each other about these fundamentals and really understand what's happening to our environments, the more we connect with folks on that will fill our love and esteem needs in whole new ways, the way I see in some of the happiest and healthiest communities I, I met on the wonder list. So it's sort of borrowing lessons from the best and worst case scenarios. You've talked a little bit about it, but maybe give us a a few more examples of some of the innovations that are happening out there to help us adapt to climate change and like air conditioning shirts. I guess you have encountered these. (laughs) Yeah, I I actually use them. I'm inspired by nature a little bit when I think about adaptation, like let's look from the best who do it. And did you know? I did not know until I read this book and recent science around the fossil record that camels 
are originally from Canada. For the first 40 million years, they were running around in the snow. And it wasn't until about 18,000 years ago, a few crossed the Bering Land Bridge into Asia, and they discovered that the hump of fat that was used to get them through winters worked in deserts, and their feet, which were great in snow, worked on sand, and the eyelids, triple eyelids, to keep blizzards out, kept sand out. But they didn't stop there. They had changed their personalities, the way they aligned themselves with the sun, behavior. They learned to eat toxic plants and changed everything to adapt to this hotter climate. And they had eons to change, thousands of years to evolve, but we have to figure this out right now in some places. And when suddenly we had heat waves like we have the last few years where people way up in the 50th latitude, Yorkshire, England, it's 120 degrees, British Columbia, where it was hotter than it's ever been in Las Vegas. And people in these northern climates suddenly understand why folks in Arizona keep oven mitts in the car. We have to adapt to this in building codes and how we cool, how we think about cooling. The people who live in the really hot places like Phoenix those places will get lighter because of the reflective power of white paint. A team at Purdue invented the whitest paint ever. It reflects 99% of sunlight back into deep space and can cool, actually cool a structure by 10 or 15 degrees. There's more technology around clothing that's cooler for people, outdoor workers who have to think about this. You can imagine construction moving overnight in places. There are noise issues around that, but we've seen that playing out in some real hot spots. There are ancient technologies that are making a comeback like wind catchers and canots, these underground canals that were a Persian invention, ancient Persian invention that catches the wind. And then with that underground water can cool city streets and heat pumps. Is That's an adaptation that's being, I guess, human camels and changing our ways about that we think about cooling. They're way more efficient. Most of my life, I had no idea what a heat pump sounds like a dance in the 70s. Right. But when you realize it pumps heat both ways and that Maine is our sort of star pupil in the American class of adaptation. They blew past a goal to install 100,000 heat pumps. And Dr. King did not say, I have a nightmare. People were living the nightmare. He said, I have a dream. And I think in the climate space, we don't get to talk enough about the possibility, the dreams of a better way forward, at least a stronger and, and more resilient community come what may. One of the stories that you have in the book is, and I think I'm pronouncing her name right, Heidi Lang, and she was part of that fire in paradise in California. Yeah. Tell us the story there. Yeah, this was Paradise, California, which just by the nature of the topography there had only a couple ways in and out of this picturesque mountain community in California and just big towering pines people were surrounded by. But after just record drought and howling winds, they had a fire, the campfire, which was the deadliest at the time. It was before Maui surpassed it as the deadliest in modern American history, but it's still the deadliest fire in California. It's the reason Pacific Gas and Electric went into bankruptcy after all the class action suits around fallen power lines that started that fire. It was a horrific event for the people who were trapped on the road. Their evacuation routes got jammed up, and there was so much confusion that day. And so much of the town burned, over two-thirds of it. And so going back, I went back a year later to see how people were sort of reeling from it. And you realize I see again and again on so many of these stories that when the smoke clears and the sun comes out, just the nightmare is just beginning. And fights with insurance or FEMA and just things drag on and it really tests the fabric of a community. I found that in the sudden first days after a sudden disaster, like a punch in the nose, hurricane, or even an, an attack like a 9-11, it tends to bring people together. It's sort of like people are cycling through the five stages of grief and, and at the same time. And that's how you get the hashtag, we will rebuild and the community comes together. But the longer they drag out, the more frustration can happen. You look at your neighbors in a drought and say, why is their hose running? <laughs> or it sort of really tests community bonds there. And so I, we went and just met some characters. I met this woman, Heidi Lang, who worked for the school district and everything she owned burned to the ground and 19,000 buildings, her house was among it. She never made it home that day. She was at work at the school as they were trying to 
figure out where the kids should go. And then she went through a divorce after this. I'm like, oh my God. No oh boy. Insult to injury. is like, no, actually it, the time to go through a divorce is when you don't own anything. <laughs> like both of our stuff right. burned to the ground. They had nothing, but she had to split. She had half the insurance settlement that she had. She would have had. She had to split it with her ex. And she looked around. She took inventory of everything that was still around. And she still had her community and her neighbors and her friends and her church and her job. So her soul, even though nothing she didn't have, had what was on her back was the only thing she owned in paradise, her soul and her sense of place was there. And she began to cry when she was telling me this. And it got me really choked up. She had to get really creative and ended up becoming like her own general contractor. She ran all of her own bids. She built hers for half the going price per square foot of other people while working full time in the school district. And we're walking around this house that is really risen from the ashes and has so much more soul as a result of the struggle that she had to go through. She has a metal roof now, fireproof stucco siding, fireproof attic vents. And she said like only about a third of the original population remains there. But younger people moved in, the schools are packed, the place is full of life. And while the landscape has sort of changed, the smell of smoke is sort of brings PTSD. The biggest problem is the insurance markets are so roiling there. And her insurance went from like a thousand or eleven hundred bucks a year to close to ten thousand a year now because as major insurers pull out of these places. So to, to want to stay in literal and, and figurative paradises. In the places we like so much, same goes in Florida. We're reaching a time where you may have to assume all the own risk to live in those places. And that's going to you know, shake out who can afford it and where your cops and teachers and bartenders going to live if only the people who can afford to live there have to pay cash and self-insure. So a lot of that, they're still working out. But she said the thing that was most therapeutic for her is just to dig in and look across the fence and say, how can I help you? And it truly is just like the simplest tenant of most of the major religions about service to others, especially in those times of dire need. And five years later, boy, she was a real source of inspiration for me and lessons learned. This is really interesting to me too, because with the podcast, you, I mean, you're probably familiar with the idea of managed retreat and everything. Yep. And so that's a feel good story. And we love doing that as humans. We like, okay, the rebuild, come back. I guess my question to you as someone in the media is sort of challenging these assumptions is that her rebuilding back maybe wasn't such a good idea. And I get the community. I get all that. But I think of like these flood zones where you hear these stories of these houses that have been rebuilt two, three. I've even heard of like 12 times. Yes. And should they be rebuilding back there? And even though she might have done some things right with the construction and all that, the states are coming in and like Florida's done this and California's done this is that there's state insurance and it's really altering the insurance markets. And so even though she has to pay these big higher rates, other people in the state that aren't necessarily in these climate impact zones are also in some ways subsidizing it. Mm-hmm. So this notion of rebuilding quite frankly, in areas you shouldn't rebuild in. And I get it. It's it's like this great feel-good story. But then th- there's another story too of why are they rebuilding here? Is this irresponsible? And I mean, I'm kind of putting you on the spot. No, because I, it, you're hearing that. Think of Florida and six, seven feet of sea level rise I, along the coast. I absolutely get that. And I believe me, I have asked that exact same question. I did most of a full hour documentary on trying to get folks to move an entire village down called Ile de Jean Charles, Louisiana, yep, which yep. the seas had taken 95% of their land in a century. And they won a major grant to move 50 miles inland on an abandoned sugarcane farm. And it just seemed like a win win. This is here we go. Here is a textbook masterclass in managed retreat. In that particular case, half the people didn't want to go. Half the people didn't mm-hmm. believe it was urgent enough. Half the people thought it was a land grab, given the history. It was mostly indigenous folks in that neighborhood. And there's all kinds of complications to that, but absolutely the valid question. I think paradise is different in that it is, they're not doomed to repeat that fire, especially since they've been through war. It is not a place that's going to continue to burn like that again and again, especially if they used more sensible fire management techniques in that area and have defensible spaces around their houses. There are wilderness interfaces we have no business being in. 
And in Montana, where, when they were going through the Zoom boom, when everybody during the pandemic who watched Yellowstone suddenly wanted to buy a ranch in Montana or build their dream out there, you had people in towns like Bozeman saying, hey, you love the view? Live in town. Because you build yet another McMansion out there in the wilderness, we're going to spend our tax dollars to come put it out when it's on fire. It's going to just add more pressures to our already endangered wilderness, our wildlife. And so you're absolutely right. And I think that the up in Canada, there are test cases of what that looks like when they go in and just condemn a town and say, I'm sorry, folks, we're going to give you market value here, but you got to leave. And what that looks like. That was the Salisbury Beach story I, I talked about, the beat, their sand going away in the night. That whole story was about managed retreat and the difficulties of convincing everybody on a stretch to leave at the same time. People, some people will move their houses back, will lift them up. It'll just be this piecemeal thing in a lot of places. And it is an interesting question about insurance markets. The National Flood Insurance Program is in deep trouble. But then there's already talk about, well, what if we need a national fire insurance? National wind, like, where does it stop? And you can say, look, you want to assume your own risk and pay cash and live here, go for it. But those property values in those places oftentimes support, that tax base supports a lot of the communities around them the rich folk who don't want to leave. So it's so complicated. Yeah. And it's just sort of the point of, is climate change really mean business as usual, or are we going to do something radically different? And I, I didn't realize that Canada was experimenting with that at that scale. Yeah. A lot of tough decisions and we're certainly not prepared for this. But here's a question with media coverage too. And I'm curious because you've covered this and I live in Tucson, Arizona, which there's my own irresponsible behavior for moving here like six, seven years ago <laughs> because of the issue issue of water and the Colorado River. And I'm curious on what you think of media coverage, because when it was in the news, I think it was last year when there was a big agreement about how these different states were to handle this. And it's we're still years away from, I think, actual implementation. Yeah. But every time the media does a story on the Southwest and water availability and around the Colorado River, then they go to Phoenix. They go and they focus on Phoenix, which is a couple hours north of here, much bigger city. And well, look, it's still growing really fast. And the reality is, and, and I, I've been to Phoenix. I don't like Phoenix. They, they, they're terrible. At some of the streets you go down, you think with the vegetation that you're in Wisconsin, they're so irresponsible with the water. Right. But compared to agriculture, it's still like a fraction. And so if we had these tough decisions about agriculture, then there's actually plenty of water for people to move to Arizona. And not that I want that. And Tucson actually has been really responsible too. I don't know if you follow Tucson at all. There's they're great. Yeah. Of- Rainwater harvesting. And yeah. 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 Turn up yards. They, they're, they're, we actually send our water north to Phoenix. I'm just curious your own thoughts on, it seems like occasionally they'll do like the store in ag, but we actually don't have a problem if we got serious about not growing cotton in the desert exactly. or alfalfa. <laughs> and it's, I'm actually, I'm just kind of tired of like, even though Phoenix should be their hand slapped for just how they use water, it's not a big a deal as they make it out to be if you make some decisions around agriculture. Exactly. Half of the water in the Colorado River Basin goes to growing hamburgers. It goes to feeding cows. Yeah. And people are foreign national. Arizona put a stop to it, the governor there, but foreign nationals buying ranches just for the irrigation rights to grow cow food and ship back to Saudi Arabia or China. It doesn't make any sense. And I've talked about this on most of the trout stories I did back in the days when we were really focused on the West, when the Lake Mead and and Powell were super low, like insanely low. We went and did a story on St. George, Utah, one of the fastest growing cities in the country. All these pickleball playing retirees move into this picturesque Red Rock Desert, and they're counting on a 140-mile pipeline from Lake Powell, which politically... And physically, and the energy use it would take to pump is just a dream. It's a complete pipe dream. And a mayor in one of these little suburban developments around St. George said so, like on a Zoom meeting. And that was enough, made enough news for me to go meet that guy. And he was saying exactly that. People who come out here, you have to have a completely different mindset about every drop of water. It makes no sense to have a lawn here. And we've outlawed them. It, and if somebody wants to get a permit for a golf course right now, I would laugh them out of town. It is easy to focus on the golf courses in Phoenix when you're doing a drought story. 
but a semiconductor fab plant uses way more water than a golf course that makes our phones, right? And we don't think about, and that again is sort of when I think about the pyramid of needs, the stuff I took for granted, I was just up, I took my family a couple of weeks ago just for a one night stay in the Catskills and came across towns that I didn't realize in the 1950s, this is not in the pioneer days, but in the 1950s, entire towns were condemned and flooded to create reservoirs for New York City. The towns of ironically named Never Sink and Bittersweet were just drowned. And, and it's like, that's not something you, that a story we talk about when you open up the tap, where you talk about how great the water is that makes our New York City bagels and pizza crust. Our choices around water now matter way more than ever. And conservation, especially in the American West, just had, had a different mindset has to take place. But that Colorado River Compact was made at a time record high water levels, and it's such an ancient document. I think it's fascinating. But places like Tucson and Vegas have proven you can grow population while decreasing water use if you're super smart about it. Yeah, I, I mainly grew up in the East and the water laws here. I just want to bang my hand against the walls. Like, I can't believe they agreed to this even in the past. Really? It's like, yeah. It's just outrageous. How do you think the media is doing? And when I say the media, I, of course, I mean TV, print. How do you think they're doing on communicating the issue of climate change across the board? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Horribly. <laughs> Or a, Go on. Yeah, no. I, so just so for some context, the first time I got sent on a climate story, my I was a pup reporter at ABC News. I was maybe 2003 or four. And it was to do a story on sea level rise modeling that they had done at Harvard or MIT. And at that time, the attitude towards the story was, well, I had to put in the voice that doesn't believe in this, right? <laughs> I had to balance it out. And I threw in some right. soundbite oh. with some knucklehead Bostonian who made a joke about, hey, I gave up my hairspray. What do you want from me? Conflating like the ozone layer with, with the climate crisis. You know, just, I, I cringe when I think how stupid that was. But the conversation started changing in 2006, seven. Al Gore wins for the Inconvenient Truth. IPCC wins the Nobel at ABC News at the time. We did a two hour Earth Day special and I was live on the Great Barrier Reef and Diane Sawyer turned our lights out in Times Square. And I thought we had really turned a corner on that, on the story. But then Bear Stearns crashed and the recession kicked in and the Obama administration really went in on healthcare and any sort of coalitions of Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi sitting together on a couch in that CSA, those days are gone, right? The media can't get beyond the idea that these unnatural disasters are not just one-off bad luck and that I'll see you at the next storm. This is not your the, the earth systems of your grandfather anymore. And all of these stories are connected. So oftentimes I'm yelling at my TV set while there's a, some sort of a, a cataclysmic Something's happening somewhere that is getting national attention. And I'm just like, say it, say the words, say the words climate change. And I'm just frustrated by our inability to connect those dots. When I was doing the wildfire smoke coverage over the summer, when it was evident coast to coast, trying to draw the connection between the air that you can see and the stuff in the air that you can't, the methane, CO2 that is cooking us in our own juices here. I'm still, I think, probably an iconoclast, and I argue we're all going to be climate reporters sooner or later, the way we all became health reporters during the pandemic and had to learn about virology. You should understand how supply chains and profit margins are affected by droughts in the Mississippi Basin. And when these bizarre things happen, who say, I've never seen this before in my, our lives, Take 15 seconds to say, well, this is the result of what scientists have been warning us about. That's all you have to do. Just connect it. And so, and when every time you, I do a, a story about, we just set a new record for record March or the ocean temperatures are now, it's a year straight of every day is the hottest ever mm -hmm. recorded on that day. And to say, as bad as this seems, this is also one of the coolest marches of the rest of your life. And there is no satisfying season finale to this story. And the sooner we can come together around solutions and each other, the more we can mitigate the pain. So if you don't mind, I'm going to give you some feedback, not on you, but just generally about the media's 
I had this podcast on climate adaptation and what I see like the media doesn't quite get when you see stories on climate change, there's this jumping between carbon mitigation, energy, and then impacts. And I don't think a lot of the media really gets that adaptation is this emerging sector. There's this yeah. whole professionals dedicated to it. And I'd love to see more stories because usually that's a story on someone impacted, right? Someone who's flooded out, but there's really some cool things happening out there. Universities are starting off courses in adaptation. And so I try to use my podcast to sort of say, yes, it's an emerging sector. It's its own thing. And it does it. I don't think people quite get that there's people dedicated today working on climate adaptation. I would love to see more stories around that. And I don't know if you've kind of covered um, that, but I'm with you, brother. And you'll be happy. This is going to sound like I'm pandering to you, but I can prove it. I've got receipts. All right. Let's I'm working on a special hour for the whole story, Anderson Cooper's Sunday night show. The working title is Adaptation Nation, where I'm literally going out to meet. I just got back from a shoot in Florida of housing development down there where this guy's building hurricane-proof homes. Every house has a battery installed. The way the insulation is tight enough, you don't need many panels. And, And looking for examples of how physics of this story is already forcing people to think in new ways. And the people who are out in front of it, from Babcock Ranch in Florida, the first solar town in America to regenerative agriculture, figuring out how to grow different crops given the changing conditions. I'm with you. These are billion-dollar sectors right. that people aren't even talking about and should be. And I just do a plug for the podcast. I I have on some of the world's leading experts around adaptation, covering every issue you can think of, national securities. If you <laughs> feel so inclined, take a look in the archive because just – some folks, I mean, doing some amazing work in this space. I will, I will so. steal from your back, back catalog. Right. <laughs> I've got 203 episodes and I have talked to a ton of folks, Department of Defense, but a lot of academics. And there's actually a lot more going on than people realize. And I try to use, this is only one of a handful of podcasts focused on adaptation. It's what I did in a previous life. And so that's exciting, Adaptation Nation. And yeah, let's plug that here. That's, that's, um, so when is it going to come out? It'll air sometime in the summer. We're still shooting. I'm thinking about doing, we're trying to sell them on shooting some angles in Europe, some floating neighborhoods in the Netherlands. I like what Paris is trying to do with this Olympics and have the greenest Olympics ever and see what kind of ideas that they're playing with. So hopefully it'll, it'll air sometime this summer. Great. Well, I do a kind of recurring speech when I talk to groups. Is adaptation the greatest story never told? Because I'm trying to make a point <laughs> that – and I think you've said a variation of that in some of the interviews I said. You're in the whole notion of we'll all be climate reporting soon enough. It's just we're not there yet. We're so. not there yet because the, this is one of those bedeviling slow motion tragedies where even when the, the worst things happen, it feels like the sun comes out and people shrug and normalize the pain. And we're really good at that as a species <laughs> – But yeah, I I think the conversation is going to be changing. You have this climate change beat, but you're not a climate scientist or anything like that. What resources do you go to to kind of stay up to things? And of course, it naturally comes when you do a story. Do you have climate scientists that you regularly talk to or just people like that? Who are your resources? We do. Yeah, we have the network of names and trust. The beauty of the CNN brand is folks tend to return our calls. So if Catherine Ajo or Michael Mann or... Brian McNoldy down in Miami or just a network of folks that we've interviewed over the years are great go-to sources. We have a now a growing team. Everything we report has to be vetted, fact-checked, standards and practices. You'll appreciate it. We were going down a story. I was going to do a story on this famous former basketball player who claimed he had a cement that could draw down carbon. And okay. I had the story greenlit. And then when we dug into it, it turns out that the inventor of that technology was suing him. And and so luckily, I have people checking every dot and every I, crossing every T. And we have to be careful because this we live in the golden age of, of greenwashing and dishonest messaging around this stuff. I was going to include a character on a, on a special I was doing on Carbon Drawdown a couple of years ago and ended up pulling it out. We value the trusted relationships we have. I just want you to make a plug because the book is out now. And so my listeners are very wonky listeners. And so they're in this climate space and they're doing adaptation. So they don't need convincing about climate change. Yeah. So those kind of stories, what kind of plug can you give to them? And I, you've covered a lot of that ground, but is the book practical for them as ap- adaptation practitioners? I think so. If for nothing else, maybe you can take a look at the way I tell the stories and try to engage folks who don't think about this stuff every day. 
And for me, that's my biggest sort of responsibility, I think, is, is in my position is to take this really wonky, sometimes complicated science and really boil it down to the essences of what's at stake, how it affects them, how it affects the maximum amount of life on Earth, and the, the very real clear-eyed threats we have, but some hope around these ideas. And that's the best we can do. This is sort of, this book defies genre because it's a mashup of a little bit of history. I, I, I look for heroes that are undersung from Eunice Newton Foote, the woman, the suffragist who really discovered the greenhouse effect without any fanfare, and also sort of villains through history as we're told stories in, in sort of national hero tales like Buffalo Bill or Captain Cook, which I look back on as just symbols of abundant waste and needless suffering and, and greed. And that if we imagine a future in which we learn from those mistakes and connect with the developing world to help them leapfrog the carbon fuels and, and tap right into the best ideas the way, say, folks in India skip the landline and go right to the cell phone. There's a lot of biography. I've been a journeyman and have a crazy life. And so it's trying to, through this letter to my kids, atone for my mistakes and help guide them in a way that connects them, that makes them I was a Rolling Stone. I thought that was romantic, gathering no moss. It turns out that moss is a really good indicator of a healthy environment. We need some moss in our lives, some connection. And it's really just sort of a, hopefully a rallying call to action for folks to rally around each other and nature uh, and there's a brace for what's next. I know it's hard in election year to lean over the fence, especially if you know the neighbor doesn't vote like you. But to comment over the songbird migration this year or connect on the hiking trail you both love. Who knows? The civil war you prevent might be your own. <laughs> you have interviewed a bunch of people, like famous people. You've been all over the world. And I'm just very curious. How did you prepare for your interview with Paul McCartney? <laughs> well, I'm a monster Beatles fan. And, right, he, right. and what the funny thing about that interview was he had a children's book that he was selling and he mostly wanted to talk about that and very didn't really want to talk about music and definitely not about the Beatles. But I, we negotiated 15 minutes of each and we talked <laughs> about the children's book. And then when I tried to pivot to the music, he thought I was breaking the promise and I wanted to bail on the interview. Like halfway through, he starts taking off his mic. I'm like, I'm sorry. You want to talk oh, more man. about it? And then he realized, oh, yeah, you're right. Go on. And I was trying to say, <laughs> I'm like, look, I sing Blackbird to my kid every night before bed. And this is long before Beyonce just brought it back. And he said, give me a few bars. So I sang a bit of Blackbird to Paul McCartney. Oh, wow. I, I, I can take that to my grave. But it was a good lesson in interviewing your heroes. Sometimes they can be prickly. Sometimes <laughs> sometimes it's better not meeting your heroes. But he was awesome. Yeah, that, that's legend there. Last question I ask all my guests, if you could recommend one person to come on this podcast, and keep in mind this is a climate adaptation podcast, who would it be? Oh, I think Sid Kitson, the developer who built Babcock Ranch, Florida, which the first solar town in America, it, he built it in harmony with the natural wetlands. He built a big chunk of land between Lake Okeechobee and, and Charlotte Harbor, gave most of it back to the state as nature preserve, and then let the water, the natural water flow dictate how to build and raise the streets to keep them plug proof, made it all solar, buried all the lines. And during Hurricane Ian, they never lost power. And the lessons they've learned, they have innovation row where they have different builders come in with different ideas, building materials on smart homes, on batteries, on all of that. I found him utterly fascinating because he fought all the NIMBY battles, both with the oil companies who didn't want him and the wildlife conservationists who didn't want him. And had to do a deal with Florida Power and Light and just has so much knowledge about how what he's built there can be duplicated. It's like the waiting list to get a home there is years long. He's building them as fast as he can. And people have now seen a better way, an example of a better way. So yeah, Sid Kitson, he's great. Yeah, I'm from Florida and I worked in Florida for the Fish Wildlife Commission. So the Babcock branch comes up a lot. I never crossed paths with him at the time. So yeah, yeah, you know that story. So I think Governor Bush considers it one of his best accomplishments during those, was protecting that area. Bill, this has been fantastic. It's always an honor. Again, congratulations on the book and thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It was great to talk.
Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Bill for joining me on the podcast. Bill has done some amazing things in his career and nice to see him on the climate beat. I hope you feel inspired to up your climate communication game. I enjoy talking to the media. I have my own strong opinions on how they cover climate change, and I appreciate Bill's perspective on this. He gave us all some great advice on how to talk about climate change to the public. Even if you think communication isn't a big part of your job, we all need to be climate adaptation ambassadors in the coming years. The issue is only going to get bigger. Check out his book, which is now available. Links are in my show notes. I'm encouraged that Bill seemed to understand that adaptation is its own niche and worthy of its own coverage. We've been swept up too much in the mitigation and carbon part of this climate discussion. There is overlap, but there's also many stories in the adaptation space that need to be told. And I like his advice for you guys, my listeners. We can all be better climate communicators, and he had some very specific things for us in that regard. I'm also looking forward to the Adaptation Nation series Bill mentioned. I like that they used Adaptation Nation as a title and not Resilient Nation in the upcoming CNN series, hopefully out this summer. Also, don't forget about the Waterfront Conference hosted by the Waterfront Alliance. It's May 21st in New York City. Much more information in my show notes. Okay, adapters. Imagine the potential of showcasing your achievements through a widely acclaimed podcast that boasts a large network of climate and adaptation professionals. Yes, I'm talking about America Adapts and how it offers your company organization the perfect platform to tell your adaptation story and spread your message to a diverse and highly influential audience of climate professionals. By sponsoring a whole episode, you not only have the chance to share your story with the world, but also integrate a podcast episode into your organization's long-term communication strategy. It's time to expand beyond the confines of webinars and white papers, which can be dry and forgettable. Let's work together closely to identify the experts who best represent the remarkable work your organization is undertaking in adaptation through the power of podcast storytelling. This will not only enable effective communication with your members, board members, and funders, but also leave a lasting impact. The value of podcasts lies in their ability to continue promoting your story long after their initial release, ensuring it remains a critical educational resource for years to come. I'm humbled to have collaborated with prestigious partners such as Battelle, the U.S. Department of Defense, Natural Resources Defense Council, University of Pennsylvania at Wharton, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard University, a trustee of reservations, and many more. So let's add your organization to this esteemed list. Yes, we can make a significant difference in the world of climate change adaptation. To learn more about the enduring value of podcasts and how they can benefit your company or organization, email me at americadaps at gmail.com. Also, if you're interested in having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. I've been doing some keynote presentations. I was in New Jersey recently giving the keynote address for the 2024 New Jersey Coastal and Climate Resilience Conference. That was a lot of fun. The theme was adaptation, the greatest story never told. I share stories from the podcast, my own experiences in adaptation. It's also a bit of a pep talk and about what we're all doing here. These are sobering times, but also very exciting times in the adaptation field. It's such a new emerging area that you can influence the field. Let me help educate your audience on this emerging adaptation sector and how it differs from carbon mitigation and sustainability. Your companies and organizations, and especially your leadership, need to understand these differences in the years ahead. You can contact me at the website, americadapts.org. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.